Greetings, everyone, and uh, glad you could join us again for another episode of Daily Meta. We are going through Search for Nonviolent Future. We've reached page 52, so we're about one sixth of the way through the book. And I have to say, I, I am, uh, you know, sometimes when you look back at things that you've written, you're kind of appalled. That's what happened when I first read my own dissertation. But uh, I am uh, encouraged by uh, the way this book worked. And I talk about the fact that Karen Ridd in the episode we discussed last time was able to accomplish something which the entire government of uh, uh, Canada and Colombia were not able to accomplish. And that gives us a sense of how much power nonviolence actually has when it's done correctly. Now, this is not something I go on to say that you can learn through the intellect, the way we learn other subjects, but there is a cognitive component to it. And it helps very much to know what the basic principles of nonviolence are. I always like to think of a literary scholar uh, who once said, a literary critic, who said the job of a critic is to fix impressions by naming them. And in a sense, that's what Search for a Nonviolent Future does. We've all experienced the impact of nonviolence on ourselves and on the people to whom we offer it, but because we didn't have a name for it, it flits by and we don't learn anything. We don't uh, go forward. We can't build on our own experiences. Um, and then I talk about a marvelous description of Martin Luther King that was written by Marshall Frady. And this is pages 52 and 53. And I'm, I'm going on the assumption that uh, you people have access to the book and you're reading along with me. You can get it from us or a you know, bookstore or online. So I won't read the whole thing. It's a longish quote. Uh, but some of the high points I want to comment on today. Uh, we tend to feel that what happens to our fellow human beings in some way also happens to us. Now, in some way can now be translated to the mirror neurons in our nervous system. So that no man can continue to debase or abuse another human being without eventually feeling in himself at least some dull answering hurt and stir of shame. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk about that word shame a little bit. There is a difference, qualitative difference between shame and humiliation at least as used by nonviolence uh, people. And shame is something that can be very useful. Humiliation, never. Shame is where you're ashamed of something that you did because it's not worthy of you. Humiliation is where you feel humiliated by what you did because you feel that it does represent who you are. We never want to humiliate another person in nonviolence, and we never want to allow another person to humiliate us. So again, uh, shame, which can be useful to awaken an opponent, is where you're ashamed of something you did because it is uh, not worthy of you. It does not reflect who you are. Humiliation is where you feel embarrassment about something you did because it does show who you are. So that's why when we work with prisoners, for example, we often say to them, you are not the worst thing that you ever did. That's the first step in rehabilitating a person. And uh, I wanted to share an anecdote where somebody wrote to Gandhi and said, a bully slapped me. and I felt humiliated and I didn't do anything. Aren't you proud of me? And Gandhi said, I am not. Uh, you should have slapped him back. Believe it or not, Gandhi said that. And he went on to explain why did you feel humiliated? It was the bully's problem, not yours. So once you feel humiliated, you are accepting human degradation to that extent. And this is universal. If I accept degradation to in myself, I'm implying that you also can be degraded to that extent. So I should never accept it when it's offered to me and I should never, never use it as a mechanism of trying to affect change. Because what I would be doing, even if it, quote, works, unquote, I would be getting change in the short term, but degradation in the long term. 
So that's what I wanted to say about this particular topic, that you can awaken a stirring of shame in another person, and that often seems to happen when we accept pain, suffering, inconvenience of some kind without responding in kind. Because if we respond in kind, either through aversion or through reaction, the trying to hurt the other person back or running away, we are accepting the premise that one human being can shame another. Once we step above that, we show the other person what he or she or they is doing. And that's how we awaken them through nonviolence. So Freddy goes on to say, therefore, in the catharsis, good term, of a live confrontation with wrong, when an oppressor's violence is met with a forgiving love, is a beautiful writer. An oppressor's violence is met with a forgiving love. He can be vitally touched and even momentarily reborn as a human being, and so forth. So I want to comment a little bit more on that in our next conversation. But we are now, as I say, on pages 52 and 53 of Search for a Nonviolent Future. Till next time.